So today we're going to continue in our series of messages on the uh, Gospel of John. And today we'll be looking at John chapter 6. And I'll be not reading the whole chapter, that would take me way too long, but uh, I've selected just verses 26 to 40. And here's how it reads in the English Standard Version. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Dear friends, the crowd was still blown away by the miracle of over 5,000 people being fed by five small loaves of bread and two small fish. And they are now looking everywhere for Jesus. You could say Jesus at this point in time was at the height of his popularity. And yet, as we find out right after the feeding of these 5,000, Jesus is trying to get away from them. And he sends the disciples ahead in a boat which he does not enter and goes on the mountain to pray. And uh, one thing that we also didn't read this morning is then what happens in this in-between time of Jesus teaching on the other side of the lake uh, and him actually joining them at night as they're still crossing this uh, the sea, this lake, uh, in very adverse weather conditions, possibly even to the point of them being afraid, are we even going to make it? And it's that episode of Jesus walking on the water and meeting them there. And then he continues on the other side, when finally the crowds do catch up to Jesus. And he's pointing to them out the very motive why they're so interested in continuing to come to him. And the sad thing about this whole story is it's not about Jesus at all. They do not understand that the feeding itself was just a sign from God pointing to Jesus the Son that they would realize who it is that is dealing with them. And so Jesus says to them, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, 
but because you ate your fill of the loaves. On the one hand, you'd think it's a positive and wonderful thing if people are seeking Jesus, but if they're seeking him for the wrong reasons, in the end, it's all good for nothing. Imagine for a moment if we could fill this church here with several thousand people. I think the maximum capacity that we could possibly fit in this room is around 200, 250. But I can guarantee you that within a week, I could get 5,000 people trying to get in here. You know how I do it? I go on social media and I put an ad in the Edmund Journal and it says, we EFC guarantee that everyone who attends our church next Sunday will get $50 before they go home. You think we'd get 5,000? We might get even more. Now that'd be an expensive Sunday for the church. But can you see in your mind how people would come, people you've never seen before, almost, <laughs> you know, running over others, kind of like a Black Friday in the U.S., where, where everyone, you know, is already waiting at 5 a.m. in the morning, you know, to burst through the doors to, to get that one item that's on sale. Well, for 50 bucks, many people would be willing to sit here for an hour and even endure a long sermon. Hey, if I can go away with that much cash, I'd come. If you'd, eat, if you'd offer even more, probably even more people would come. But the motive behind the whole thing would not be beneficial to them at all. So they'd go home with 50 bucks. Some would spend it on, I don't know, going out for a nice Sunday meal. Someone who likes to go golfing may even be able to afford a green fee on his favorite course. And someone else might even buy a gift for someone. But all of that would be very quickly forgotten. It would not have a lasting impact on their lives. And not just because it's quote unquote only $50. But because we'd be setting our hope on purely material things on money and on what money can buy. And similar here, a people that was in a time of need where nothing was nearby, where they could have bought food, Jesus is feeding them. He has compassion on the crowds. But ultimately, that's not the reason why Jesus came into this world, to just feed the hungry. As commendable as that is, to show love to others in this way. But that kind of bread, that kind of material stuff, it feeds you for a while and then you get hungry again. It has no lasting value. The real reason why Jesus came goes so much deeper than just satisfy some needs for a little while. And similarly, we can say for us today, if all we seek in life is to fulfill our material cravings or even political ambitions, because that pops up here at one point too, Jesus becomes nothing more than a means to an end. Why did I say political ambitions? Because in verse 15 it says, Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus refused to be a bread king or to be a king to push the Romans, the occupiers out of the land and bring back the old glory times of David and Solomon. That's not why the Father sent him into the world. And so, instead of just using Jesus to fulfill what we want, we need to understand Jesus and come to him on his terms. And the first thing I'd like to point out this morning is that Jesus is greater than Moses. That's easily missed here, you know, in uh, 
the whole going back and forth of the conversation about bread and, uh, and its importance and Jesus being bread in person. But there's this little note early on in verse 3 it says, then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When you get these little comments in the Bible, they're never there just by accident. And it's not just simply giving sort of a date. As we would say, today is August the 8th in the year 2021. It doesn't carry a whole lot of meaning. But this feast of unleavened bread and the Passover, which is always celebrated together, is one of the high points of Israel's annual calendar. And it is a continuing remembrance of what God did in Egypt when he let them out of captivity and slavery. And in a sense, right there, made them into a nation that would come and worship him and acknowledge him as their, as their God. There are some elements here in John chapter 6 that relate directly to the Passover and this deliverance of God and the Exodus story. The first one I mentioned already, and that is... The passage through the waters. Now, Jesus not having a staff in his hand, you know, and kind of making a path for his disciples to walk to the other side of the lake, but something quite similar happens here. In him walking on water and meeting them in a time of great peril, where they may have been wondering, what happens to us now? Jesus is far away and we're struggling here on the lake in the middle of the night. I want to read to you a few verses that looks back to the Exodus. And just notice how much of that would also apply to what's happening to the disciples on the lake. Psalm 77, I was just going to read uh, verses 19 and 20. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And I believe the greater miracle here in this particular event between the feeding of the 5,000 and the continuing teaching on the other side of the lake, is not that Jesus is able to walk on top of the waves. And those were quite some ways. They're not a calm lake. They're in the middle of a storm. But the real miracle is what is being said immediately after. And here's what it says. Let me actually start already in verse 18. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and now it comes, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. You see what's happening here? At least in their perception, they were in the middle out of nowhere and they did not know how they're going to make it to their destination. But Jesus not only joins them in the midst of this great distress, but immediately they reach their destination. It says nothing about Jesus calming the storm or you know, them now continuing to row for a while, and then eventually they, they, they get uh, to the shoreline at the other end. But immediately they find themselves right where they needed to be, 
I can't tell you how that happened, but this is how they experienced it. Just like the people of Israel went through the Red Sea as if it was on dry land. And this time it is Christ himself that leads them there. Jesus is greater than Moses, particularly because he doesn't just give bread. And that would be the other part of what relates to the Exodus, the feeding with manna for 40 years, God sustaining his people miraculously for such a long time. Imagining heading to the Alberta Badlands, you know, where they have the passion play and <laughs> it's desert-like. It's kind of the scenery you have to imagine. How would a people survive there very long? By the way, I read some <laughs> descriptions of what happens uh, at the Alberta Passion Play. Some people never bring enough water and they always have medical crews standing by because there's always some people guaranteed to collapse. And that's just a few hours in the intense heat of the summer sun in that kind of environment. But they're here 40 years, not days, not hours, years. And the manna becomes this memorable way of God feeding them for an entire generation. Now Jesus doesn't just feed 5,000 people. He tells them, I am the bread of life. That's something that Moses never was. In a sense, he's just a servant whom God uses to save his people. Jesus in person is life itself. This is in a sense already what he would later say in one of the other I am sayings in John chapter 14. It's one you also probably all know, John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. And you can see that connection between bread and life. Even though it may not be literally bread, what you may have had this morning, some of you may have had cereal, or I don't know what you eat for breakfast, egg and bacon maybe, or waffles, or just fruit. But it stands for what sustains and what energizes you and what strengthens you and what satisfies your hunger. And now Jesus contrasts that which only satisfies temporarily with a hunger that is stilled forever. Permanently, for all of eternity, Jesus is that kind of life. And, and you have to think about what kind of an outrageous statement that is. We in the church are kind of used to it because we've heard it so often. and We may not think about that a whole lot, but for... Just someone who stands in front of people as another human being and says, I am the very personification of life eternal. You can understand why C.S. Lewis once said, you know, with Jesus you don't have too many options. He could be a liar, someone who intentionally deceives just trying to lure people in with great promises. Meanwhile, all the time knowing that, yeah, he's, he's telling them a lie. And that's why it's so outrageous. Or maybe he's a little cuckoo. Maybe we should send him to Pinocchio. At least I was told there is a mental health hospital. And so maybe Jesus needs treatment for his mental health. Or, and that's the third option, he's telling the truth. 
There's not a whole lot in between there. And Jesus is never making an excuse for making all these outrageous claims about himself. Because he knows who he is, where he came from, and why he came into this world. Just to quickly recap here from our text this morning. Jesus talks about doing the Father's will. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And what is that will? Write the next verse. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. So not only has he come to fulfill the will of the Father in being the Savior of the world, and in that sense give life, reconciling us to God, but also for the future. Greatest challenge we all face, without exception. Physical life will come to an end. And here is what Jesus will do. He will raise us up on the last day. That's how powerful he is. I mean, forget about walking on water. Some people still struggle with that. And think, oh, they made that up. No one walks on water. But to resurrect an entire world, millions and billions of people, <laughs> I think that's a whole lot more than just being able to walk on water. And yet that is the one who called this world into being, who was right there when the Father spoke. Remember how John, right in the beginning of his gospel, talks about Jesus being the Word, again, in person. Not just speaking words, but being the Word. And that everything was made through that Word, in other words, through Jesus, and then for Him. This is His universe. This is His creation. And so that promise again, that sounds so outrageous, can be trusted. Because we need to remember who is speaking here. I just want to spend a little bit of time deliberating how Jesus rescues and sustains us. In verse 29, <clears throat> Jesus said to them, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has interesting how two terms are brought together that are so opposite to our natural way of thinking. When we hear work, we think we need to put in an effort. We need to do something. We need to show something for which we ultimately will be rewarded. But then Jesus flips that kind of word usage and says, the actual work that is necessary here is something that God gives to you and your work is to accept it, trustingly accept it. This is about the gift of God in His Son and the work we're called to do is not make sure you show up for a church every Sunday, make sure you give enough for charitable purposes and make sure you help the old lady to the other side of the street. And then that will be the reward. No. Believe in the one whom the Father has sent. That is the true work. By the way, this was already reflected in prophecies of the Old Testament, particularly in Isaiah chapter 55. Listen to this. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come by wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. 
It's a different kind of bread, different kind of nourishment. It has a lot to do with listening. By the way, the disciples were the ones that realized that in the time that they had already spent with Jesus, what that special thing was that was going on. Just to be able to be close to him, be able to listen to him. Because soon after, Jesus is done teaching on the meaning of him being the bread of heaven and even pointing to his flesh as given for the world and that we are asked to eat, and even using language like drinking his blood, which he certainly did not mean literally, but people took it that way and thought, we're not cannibals. And then it says many left. Many people followed him no longer, it says in verse 66. And then Jesus turns to the disciples in verse 67. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So they've already experienced that. The words that Jesus shares with them as a small group or with a greater crowd. There's life in it. They experience it as life-giving. This creates hope in them. This creates joy. This creates the kind of satisfaction that only God can give. And remember what Jesus said in response to Satan. Uh, during the time of the uh, temptation in the desert. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So the words, Jesus being the word and Jesus sharing his word is absolutely central in being fed by this heavenly bread. That's one way how Jesus rescues us and sustains us. Speaking this life-giving word, inviting the trust to be put towards him. And then, one more thing, to keep us safe. This is now spoken towards the future. And goes along with many other sayings in John. We'll come up later again with the picture of the Good Shepherd. But here in chapter 6, if you look at verse 37 and 39, he says, All those that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, or like some translations put, I will never cast out. In verse 39, one more time. This is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me. Not a single one will be lost who's in his care. I mean, if that's not an encouragement for you today, I don't know what else will be. That Jesus has you in his mighty hand. And in another chapter in John, he says, no one can snatch you out of this hand that holds you. Wow. What a promise. But also what power, because when I look at my fickle faith, when I look at phases in my life, you know, where I'm just depressed and feeling down or where I'm not feeling very hopeful at all, but then to experience again, you know, God doesn't just leave us in these dark times. He doesn't just leave the disciples there struggling in the middle of the lake wondering why Jesus sent them off. But he will do everything he can to meet you right there. And if that means walking through water, he will get there. That's who he is. That's what he promised to do. And it's a promise that at least I personally can say he's always kept always taking care of me, he's always taking care of my family, 
And yes, there were difficult times. He doesn't spare us those. And the same is true for you. And I'm sure many could stand up here this morning and testify to that fact, how Jesus has been faithful in keeping his promise. Just very quickly at the end, the question could be asked, but what about people's unbelief? And there was unbelief. Majority of the crowd here is not really giving Jesus the kind of trust that he's looking for. But it's not surprising him or detracting him in any way, and he just simply states it as fact, verse 36. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. By the way, so many people today are saying, you know, if, if only God would show up, even just for a few seconds, you know, then I would believe. If I could just have him say something to me personally and using my name. And if I heard those words, you know, I'd be a Christian just like that. But they're fooling themselves. And you know why? Because God did just that. He walked on this earth. That's who Jesus is, second person of the Trinity. It is I, he says to the disciples. It's not just, oh, by the way, it's me. Don't think it's a ghost. No, th this is the way God introduced himself to the Israelites. I am who I am. He is the great I am. So God did show up, and you could see him. You could even touch him. Remember Thomas? Unless I can touch his, you know, the remaining wounds from the crucifixion, uh, I'm not going to believe he's really alive. And so he shows up just for Thomas. He gives the invitation, come on, Thomas. And Thomas falls down before him. My Lord and my God and worships him. But here, God shows up in person for over 5,000 people. 5,000 relates only to the men, and we can safely assume it was not just males who were being fed. And the vast majority just looks yet for another free meal, another free lunch. One thing that Jesus explains is that from our own insight and motivation, we would never come to God. God has to do something first before we're even able to understand who Jesus is and to come to him. It has to do with the Father giving people to Christ. That's how it's expressed in verse 37. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And the other one is in verse 44. That's again past the passage that we've read. It says there, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them. So the, the main reason even the 12 are there is because God, through the Holy Spirit, drew them to himself. It's almost like a spiritual resurrection that has to happen first to people who are dead in sin and totally clueless when it comes to who Jesus is and why he came into this world. And yet at the same time, we don't see that as God just, you know, overriding people's free will. And they can't just help but respond positively. In that very question put to the disciples that we heard about earlier, you want to go away too? That option is always open. But when people do come, we can absolutely be sure that this was only because God did enough to enable them to hear and sense the pull of the love of God for them. 
And I believe every single one who is sitting in this church today is here because to one extent or another they've experienced God drawing you. God somehow spoke to you. God gave you an inkling that He's real. And that Jesus is not a liar. He's not a deceiver. He certainly is not crazy when He makes such an amazing offer. I want to close with a statement by Peter who looking back on his own life wrote the following to some of the early Christians right away in the first chapter the form of 1st Peter. I'm going to start in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now it comes. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So not only have you come to faith by God's power, but you're being kept, you're being shielded, you're being safeguarded by the very power of God in Jesus Christ, who the Bible tells us is the advocate at his right hand who's praying for us until the day when we meet him face to face. Let's pray.